When people think of gymnastics now, they typically think of athletes doing flips, swinging from rings, and balancing on parallel bars. But originally, gymnastics simply meant any type of physical training, that is, anything done in a gymnasium. Calisthenics comes from the Greek words kalos, meaning beauty, and sthenos, meaning strength, which is an interesting combination. Beauty clearly implies an ascetic element, a part which is largely left out of calisthenics today. When people perform modern push-ups, pull-ups, and similar exercises, the primary thing on their minds is cultivating strength and doing the largest number of repetitions. However, that wasn't so in the mid-19th century, especially when you consider the rise of Swedish free gymnastics, which went on to hugely influence many aspects of physical culture in both Europe and America. So, what exactly were these free gymnastics? The origins date to the 1790s, when the Swedish method began to be developed by Pierre Henrik Ling, a fencing master, poet, and world traveler about whom there are some pretty amazing stories. To relate merely one, while in old age, Ling was teaching a class on the importance of principles and science over strength, and was vocally doubted by one of his students. Whereupon, he ordered several other students to take a pike down off the wall, a pike basically being a large military spear. Lang put his back against the wall and ordered the students to try to run him through with the pike. And when they rushed him, he parried the entire weapon using only his little finger, deflecting the point just past him into the wall. So Ling was a pretty extraordinary guy. Around 1810, Ling officially founded his comprehensive system of physical exercise, which became known as, quote, free gymnastics, because it was done empty-handed. You could practice the exercises anytime and anywhere, with no equipment or apparatus, in your bedroom, out in a field, or on board a ship. Swedish gymnasiums did contain ropes, stall bars, and parallel bars, but the bulk of the system required nothing but your own body, which made it extremely useful for soldiers and sailors who could do these exercises every day, no matter where they were. Ling devoted his entire life to the propagation of this system, which he believed to act as a sort of preventative and curative medicine, designed to counteract the, quote, evil effects of our modern civilization. Swedish calisthenics was not merely concerned with the development of strength, but also with elasticity, balance, coordination, respiration, rhythm, neuromuscular control, skill, and willpower. Attention was given to every part of the body, no matter how minute, and unbalanced power in any one direction was to be avoided. Thus, Ling's Swedish method was truly a holistic system, its fundamental principle expressed as, quote, the oneness of the human organism, the harmony between mind and body. Ling's method became hugely popular in Scandinavia, and later spread throughout Europe and America, and it was influential on the other physical culture methods of the time, even informing the use of wands, Indian clubs, and dumbbells. Because the way that the Swedes looked at it, very scientifically, was that any part of the body could be made into a lever, to provide resistance, and eventually, to get stronger, people added additional weight to those levers in the form of exercise tools. But it wasn't just physical, it was also mental and spiritual, and aesthetic, just as the kalos part of the word calisthenics implies. Indeed, as one treatise described it, quote, the exercises should not flavor too strongly of the circus, dancing school, or barrack, but should contain some of the good characteristics of each. In recent decades, some have even speculated that the Swedish method was derived from Chinese exercises like Tai Chi, and that, in turn, modern yoga is itself derived from Swedish gymnastics. And although I disagree with those theses, and may address them in a future video, it is easy to see how someone could think that. If you superficially glance at the photos and drawings of Swedish exercises from those times. But although the pictures are static, the postures shown in them were not static, as in yoga, nor were the movements similar in theory, purpose, or mechanics to those of Tai Chi. Postures were only momentarily maintained, or in the case of advanced students, for no more than a handful of seconds. Instead, Swedish gymnastics were all about the extremely slow movements that involved transitioning between these postures, so much so that it became known in the West as the, quote, movement cure. The Swedish system of gymnastics comprised three main categories. Military gymnastics, which were movements for control of others, such as fencing, wrestling, and boxing. Medical gymnastics, which comprised massage and physical exercises for healing. And educational gymnastics, which were movements for self-control, that is, 
calisthenics. All these categories were said to complement the others. It is the last category, however, educational gymnastics, which comprised the free exercises, and which went on to influence so much of 19th century physical culture, with countless treatises published in Scandinavia, Germany, France, England, and America. And in later exercises with dumbbells and Indian clubs, one can observe some of the same postures and movements used in the Swedish method, as we'll eventually see. The last good footage of Swedish gymnastics comes from the 1940s and 50s. By then, it was already in severe decline, and although there have been some attempts to revive it in recent years, one can see that the attention to precise form and synchronized movement do not match what can be seen in the footage of the past. In our next video, we will practice some of the exercises from 19th century calisthenics and Swedish free gymnastics, doing our best to adhere to its original form and aesthetics. 